Thanks everyone for coming back for the, the last session on uh, publishing uh, methodological papers. So we've got uh, Shinichi Nakagawa, uh, Max Schofield and Jane Eilith. So Shinichi was a former uh, editor on Methods in Ecology and Evolution. Uh, Matt is a current editor and Jane is on the board for diversity and <coughs> distributions and handles lots of, is it fair to say, handle a fair few methodological papers there? Yes. All right. So I guess, um, so what we want to do, I've just got a couple of questions and then we'll, we'll throw it to the audience. Actually, I've got one question, then we'll throw the audience <laughs> to see what you've got to say. Um, so, and if you could, yeah, I guess we'll just repeat the questions from here. I guess that's a good way to handle it. Um, so I guess my first question, I guess I'll, I'll just pass, pass the microphone along. Um, do we need the microphone? Yeah, okay, that helps. <laughs> helps. Okay, so I guess could each of you just sort of briefly uh, say something about your experience as an editor, like how long you've been sort of doing the job and what sort of journals, and um, and we'll follow that up with um, what what you like to see in a paper, what you look for. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Shin Nakagawa, and um, I'm behavioral ecologist by training. And I've been interested in methodological stuff. And uh, so I've done, I've just finished my three years with method ecology and evolution. I've been doing the editor job for the behavioral ecology and also the associate editorial job for, I think, four or five journals, including um, biological reviews, BMC biology, ethology, and EMU. Because I can't say no, I'm Japanese, so I'm just <laughs> keep, keep taking lots of jobs. So what, what I look for uh, in a paper, method one, especially because I'm not like formally trained mathematician or statistician, I like the methodological paper which I can understand. And the level of mathematics, you, I mean, the high school math is as high as most of us can, you know, can understand. And, uh, we, we do, uh, I quite like the like complicated mathematical things, but th this should be all in that kind of probably in supplement. Well, no, um, yeah, the um, electrical supplement. I think I look for the paper which I read uh, and I can see the implications and all those things and uh, that makes me feel very clever, I think. <laughs> yeah, 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 so that's what I look for. Uh, <laughs> so my name's Matt Schofield and uh, I'm a statistician. Uh, I've been in AE, on MEE for just over a year. I've also recently started as an AE for biometrics. And uh, what I look for in a, in a paper is, is, is actually fairly similar to Sunishi. Um, you'd be surprised how many papers I get that I, I read it and go, did the author even read this before they sent it to me? <laughs> and uh, you know, there's things that don't make sense. There's incomplete sentences, and, and, you, and you go, "Well, this one's easy to reject." Um, and, and a lot of the time, I don't know if I should probably say this. You know, I'm looking for reasons to reject papers. And so, if 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 I can't understand the English, let alone the, the mathematics, it's it's an easy one to to put in the bin. Um, and so, so you know, first first read through. I'm, I'm trying to see: can I understand this? Does it have a clear point? Do they know what you know what their contributions are, and, and be able to explain that uh, simply and, and understandably, and, and put a put a good case across? So I'm Jane Ellis. Uh, I'm currently an editor for um, diversity and distributions and ecology. Um, I've in the past worked for ecography and biological invasions and I've got quite different papers from those. I tend to get, um, I, I often get ones on species distribution models um, and I guess as I look for different things as an editor as I do for a, as a reader probably. Um, as an editor obviously the papers you send out to review you've got certain criteria and you're trying to pick papers that are well executed, that are novel in the field, that um, I particularly care that methods are used well, so if I feel the person writing it hasn't read the literature or hasn't applied the methods 
well I tend to send things back and asking them perhaps to do some more work before they send it in again. I, you know, I think it's important in our area, especially when both ecologists and statisticians are contributing to this field, it's important that we progress, you know, my, my bias is I want to progress methods well, and so um, it's good to publish things that are things that you want someone else to repeat. So I guess that's one of my um, biases as an editor. I must say that it's thinking about this audience and thinking that we've got statisticians and ecologists here, I find it really hard to get strongly quantitative reviewers in my area. So it's, you know, I've got some statisticians I just hassle all the time to help me review and I'm always on the lookout for strong quantitative people, whether they're statisticians or ecologists, to review papers because it just makes a lot of difference. We want both ecologists and, and um, statisticians to be reviewing these papers so that we actually progress methods well. So any of you who aren't asked enough to review papers, especially if you're very quantitative, please come and see me because I need more people. Um, and I think that actually is quite an impediment to the progress of our field, that, that um, not having enough good quantitative reviewing. Because when I, as a reader, look at papers, I look at someone and think, how did this get through the review process, you know? And, um, and quite often, criticism of papers aren't really statistically based, as far as I'm concerned. You know, and it's, it's obviously important as well to have good ecology in papers. Um, it's great to have both, but um, you know, I think we really do want to be progressing how well we use methods and developing new things well. Thanks. Yeah, and I guess um, yeah, I guess one one thing I'd add to that from from my experience um, as well. Um, like if it's a methods paper proposing a new method, I want to see it, them demonstrate that it works well. Uh, so I guess that's part of the novelty. But you can anyone can develop a new method for doing something. I could develop a new method for estimating how many bats there are in Australia. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my watch. I'm going to drop it on the ground and time it. Jeez, this isn't a good method already. <laughs> but um, and I'll, I'll multiply that time by 100, and that's my estimate of the number of bats in Australia. Like you can, you can come up with any <laughs> method of doing something. Um, the question is, is it a good method? Does it work well? And so, I, 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 I personally, I want to be to be convinced that there is some merit in the new method. Uh, so simulations is a good thing to do. Illustrating by example, worked examples are a good thing to show how it, how it's done. But yeah, like uh, so it, yeah. So for me, I, I, that's that's what I look for in a new method: some demonstration that it's a good method. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. So as I said, I'm not statistician nor a mathematician, but I really very much welcome those papers, not new method, but the new application. Yeah. So for most of sort of ecologists. Uh, pure ecologist, most of statistical literature impenetrable. But the, quite often, those people who can read that statistical literature, they can translate that method and even like put new spin on it. And uh, those papers seem to be very well cited, and uh, that's really one I look for. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, we're, we're, I think we're making it tough on people though. But we've, we've got a uh, we want we want new methods. We want like uh, something that's easy to understand, something that's like new and shows that it works well. It's a tough ask, and I guess one thing that's going on here is that we've each got different papers in mind. Like you, like you just mentioned, there are new applications, novel applications. There's new methods, there's new applications. There's lots of different types of, of, of paper, yeah, with different goals. Yeah. Um, questions. Oh, do you need a microphone for a question? Probably not. <laughs> Um, I've seen, I think, lately a proliferation of papers that uh, sort of purport to increase statistical understanding, maybe, uh, especially like something like statistical report, reports in, in ecology. Um, but there seems like there's a fine line between something that should be more like in a book chapter or something like that that's not necessarily that novel. I mean, do you have, is there some sort of you know, gradient there that you say um, it, it, it's important to increase the understanding of statistics, but it's not necessarily new, but it might be a, a new insight. Uh, I mean, how do you, how do, especially MEE, how does it fall in that? Does it have to be a, a new application or a new method? Or if it's just 
more purely a, a contribution to understanding an existing method better? Is that actually something you look forward to? Or is it so you're saying is there is there a role for statistics communications papers? So I things that so. aren't aren't novel, but it's just sort of you know reminding people how to do use this method. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've written one of those. <laughs> uh, I think that there's de there's definitely a keen audience for those, and and I think it's an important part of the scientific process personally that that we that especially non-statisticians can read and understand methods well, because I'm not a statistician, I really like to understand methods before I use them, and it's hard work, it's really hard work, and it takes years sometimes to understand it well. And if you put years and years into understanding a method and you've worked with statisticians or computer scientists to understand it, I actually think surely that's a good service to, to other people to pass that on. Now, I agree book chapters are good for that, but I, but I I guess I try and get them into articles because I think they're better read. But no, it doesn't pass your test of novelty though. I guess it passes the um, test of, uh, I think it is science communication. So. That's probably also, as we get more and more journals, there's more pages. In the past, those pages were more precious. So, you know, that sort of a paper, maybe because you thought it could be in a book or something like that, did not get in as much, but now it seems like it, it's changing and it's more accepted, and so I just wonder if you have a comment? I can say something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all I can say is, is what would happen if one came across my desk as an AE for, say, MEE. I mean, to me, there'd have to be something new, right? If it's just explaining it the same as what Joe Bloggs explained in Ecology in 2013, then it's not getting anywhere. But if it's explaining it differently, if it's you know showing how to use it for a different kind of application, and, and really you know opening that up to a whole whole new set of um, applications, if it's you know developing some insight that that hadn't been done before, then, then sure. Yeah, I think there's definitely a place for sort of those pedagogical <coughs> or educational paper, and I think a good example is the. Method in Ecology Evolution, first volume by Zhe, is that how you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. Zhe et al. Mm -hmm. I think that might be the one with the best cited paper. And it, it's basically model about model checking and the diagnostics. And, uh, but they did it in a really nice way. And uh, with R code, with implementation. So I think this implementation bit is very important because statistic, fewer statistical papers, they don't they often do not give the sort of the implementation bits, but the people are putting together a set of functions, even putting as a R package, and that's really, I'm likely to accept or recommend acceptance, so definitely send it for review. Any other questions? Uh, yep, Ian? I guess that was kind of related to my question was the role of kind of tutorials for demonstrating the use of these methods and kind of, you know, because pages can be precious, whether there's some kind of um, risk of producing too much, um, and I know a lot of it can be put into a supplementary material section, but you've got, you know, you can demonstrate things, effectiveness through simulation or through application to real data, and then you have reproducible research and R tutorials and all of this sort of thing. So uh, just some commentary on that. Um, so it seems like you're saying that you appreciate when you've got sets of functions that are shared and kind of tutorials demonstrating things, but I'd like to hear a bit, maybe a bit more on that. So you're saying how much, how much space in a paper yeah, should, should be Yeah, kind of like in terms of the focus, stuff. because um, yeah, obviously it's showing that something works, you can do it in multiple ways. You can show it through simulation, you can show it through real data, you can show it through both. And um, so maybe, I guess, an optimal strategy for <laughs> Maybe there's no single answer to that. But. Yeah, I think there's probably no optimal strategy. Yeah, <laughs> it depends. But it, is there anything else on find, finding a balance between sort of worked example stuff and um, I guess the beefy part, beefy meaty part of the paper? I think there is an appreciation for doing a having some elements of worked example in there to mm -hmm. show people how something works in practice. 
So it's worth trying to get some elements of that. Yeah, because you're not going to just want to put out a method out there and then you, someone will read it and say it's nice, but they won't know how to use it. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean, anytime I want to use some new method, I, I want an example to follow. And so it helps helps me understand stuff personally to, to have some, some example that I can sort of hold on to. <laughs> and I think we are thinking different audiences, aren't we? Like, like there are a range of audiences, right? And, and I mean, you, you're, you're editing for biometrics, right? So a biometrics paper is going to look quite different to, to one in ecology. Yeah, they do like their examples in biometrics, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Glenda. I'm just going to ask a question to get a bit of discussion going. Uh, in a hypothetical paper, um, so quite often what happens, and I'm an editor of a few journals, so I see this from both sides, but what happens is there's almost editorial input to how the paper should have written the paper that was in the editor's mind. Yes. And by the way, the referees' comments are not adjudicated, but just outright accepted as do everything they say, rather than a decision. But So what I'm getting us to think about here is that in a methods paper, what somebody often has is real data. Then what they do is they look for the appropriate method and find there isn't one on the shelf or isn't one well used or well known. Next step is they find something that is fit for purpose and then they apply it to the real data. And quite often what you get back is, well, such is nice, but I'd rather you did that on simulated data. Now, <laughs> comments. So someone starts with some real data, yeah. finds a method that works for their problem. Modified and then one method is applied. Yeah. Submits, submits a paper and is told that they should use simulated data. Correct. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it was this journal. <laughs> <laughs> it happens out there quite a bit. I guess you can do the simulated data. It's usually quite nice, isn't it, simulated data. That's why and you can make up different scenario because if that, you know, your original data, it's sort of applicability or special uh, circumstances, you know, you're not sure this method performs very well. So that's why probably I haven't asked that <laughs> one either. But uh, I think then you can do the simulated different scenario plus as a worked example, you could use your own. Or you publish the method first and then publish something else in the more empirical I, I mean, I would never personally ask for simulated results at the expense of real data, but I think like, but a like the others, I, to, I think to, that's simulation the, the idea of a simulation, though. To, to yeah. back up the properties of the model and, you know, is it doing what you think it's doing? You know, I, I, I could ask for something like that, but, but I would never do it at the expense of, of a real data. Yeah. I guess my point is they answer very different questions and I think the matching of a new application to a method to be fully explored a simulated data set is appropriate and really good. However, it doesn't help the we want to actually use it on this data set and we've already made some novel advance with that. If, where would that go if it isn't this journal? You know, other journals don't want that because it's too much method description. And so it, there ends up not being a nice fit for that sort of paper now. It's like if you use a method someone already uses a lot, they're happy. If not, they say, well, that method's fine, but I've got another method you should have used. So there's this um, thing going on now with real data sets being quite hard to publish with a new method. And this is just a journal where I think the discussion's worth having. Well, I mean, just to, to go back to what I said before, I mean, it, if it's a completely new method, I, I as, a, as a statistician would be uncomfortable making claims about a data set and about populations or you know whatever it is you're making if we can't trust that that method works. And so that, I mean, that would be why I would ask for simulations because I want to make sure that the claims you're making about the real data that, it, that could be quite important in the real world can be substantiated through you know, simulation and, and that, that the model does what you think it does. So I can't answer your where should you send this to, um, but but that's why I think that you might find that you're going to have to do that quite often is 
because if you get someone like me, they're going to go, well, you know, maybe they don't trust what you're doing, or they go, I think it's all right, but I just want to make sure. And, you know, it's some really important, really important applications that you're talking about. We don't want those to be, to be wrong, you know, and, and rather check with simulation than find out five years down the track when someone publishes a paper that goes, by the way, did you guys know that in these sorts of situations this model's terrible? Um, so quite often it's not a completely new method, there really is that kind of thing. Quite often it's a method from a slightly different discipline, and what it is is method is unknown to reviewer. <laughs> reviewer thinks paper is bad. And I would think an editor has a role to play there. When you cite where method comes from. Yes. And it's been used in data sets. Yeah. So you're not trying to prove the method has, um, has watertight as that. You're actually just, what is in, what I think that you guys have said quite nicely, which is it's a new application to a new kind of data with explanation. Yeah, and I think what, so what Glenda's saying is, for the sake of people who are listening to this elsewhere, is that um, uh, the review process is frustrating at times and editors don't always take charge of the review process and it, and it is difficult when you have very opinionated reviewers and you, you, you have editors that don't take charge of that review process because I think all of us as authors would like to feel like their paper's been given a fair go and that you're not being asked to write a paper that somebody else wanted to, you know, somebody else about somebody else's idea. You actually want to write a paper about your own idea uh, but it's nice to have good guidance, and so editors do have a really important role to play in that, in terms of giving guidance about how to um, interpret what the reviewers have done. I think it's important. And, and I would say related to that is the randomness of the editorial process. And so with MEE, probably half of the papers that, that I get aren't directly in my research area. And so I do my best job to find reviewers that are in that area that are knowledgeable. And when those when those reviews come back, I I have to rely on those reviewers and their knowledge. The other 50%, I can apply a lot more understanding and filter them through and go, well, that's that, that's not a very good comment. You know, you can kind of forget about that one. Um, but but unfortunately, we they don't always get matched up to the to the right editors for for whatever reason. And, and I guess just getting back to the original like question, I've got a, a data set and I find a good method for it and so I've got a new application, where can I send that? I think there's lots of journals you could send that sort of paper to. I think Methods and Ecology and Evolution is one of them. And I, I can think of a few examples, like recent examples of papers like that there um, and, and in other places too. So it, it's, yeah, you can certainly make it work. <laughs> yeah, Nigel. I was just wondering, in MEE, have there been any ideas to conduct double blind or triple blind peer review to determine if there are actually any biases by the editors or the reviewers, you know, and do you, do you think it could be an issue within yeah. the journal? Yeah, so uh, uh, that, that question, so the question was about double blind or triple blind? Yeah. What's triple blind? The editors um, don't know? The editors yeah. don't see the names. Yeah, right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> but then it's hard to sort of, I mean, look for the, yeah, like a reviewer, because you might ask the same, like, the author. That's probably it, see okay. Yeah, computer says no. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, um, I, I actually had a discussion with Bob O'Hara about this when another journal went double blinds and about whether or not methods and ME was thinking of going there and um, at, at that point in time he was not a believer in it um, because there's kind of one bias gets replaced by another bias and so you can sort of uh, there's counter arguments about whether or not it, it's a good thing to do and um, yeah so I, I don't think ME is going there in the near future but you know you can always check with Bob <laughs> that was the last answer on it yeah being an empiricist again um one thing I've read about recently for another journal is that with the double blind process, it means what they can do is resubmit a paper that had already been in the journal and see if it gets rejected. And the answer is it gets rejected quite a lot from their own journal. Right. Yeah. Okay. So someone has 
abuse the double blind process to sub to no, it's no. checking on the journal publishing process. Yeah. And where you have double blind, it's an advantage because the name yeah. is not there. Yeah. So they just accept this paper for review, send it out for review, and reject it at a high proportion. But being papers that actually had already been published in the journal. Yeah. Yeah. So papers that were published in their journal get sent out to review at the same journal by let's call them smart asses. <laughs> and, um, and they got rejected. Well, yeah. maybe they got rejected because it's not novel. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that set aside, I mean, it just yeah. shows that we yeah. have a lot of room in the science endeavour to refine this process. And yeah, it emphasises there is a lot of randomness. Yeah, there certainly is a lot of randomness in the process, and the same paper can get to different, different results from the same journal, for sure. negatives to being double blind but introduce other biases. I just wondered if you could elaborate on that because I'm not Yeah, sure. yeah. Okay. So can I can I elaborate on this thing about this negative stuff about double blind? Um, other biases that get introduced. I can't elaborate on it. <laughs> Bob, Bob tried to argue it to me and showed me a graph. Um, I think it's on his blog. He's got a blog, Random Mumblings from the Basement or something. <laughs> it called? Like, uh, but yeah, you, know, you can, you could. I think he's got it there. But we could always, I could always, uh, yeah, we could direct you to his the, the argument. So, perhaps at the USA conference last week, for those who, who weren't there, um, there was a talk on gender inequity in ecology, and and Mark Bergman presented some data on double blind reviews and the percentage of ecology journals. So, so. Um, a group of people have gathered some data on this and they actually will try and publish this data, these data. Uh, but you'll probably be able to, if you Googled that talk, you'll be able to find a video of it soon, I think. And, and there are information there on how many ecology-related journals are using Double Blind Review and it's, it's actually more than I expected. And, and I think there is gaining evidence that, that um, uh, there are biases when you don't do Double Blind Review and they um, decline do the double blind review. So it would be interesting to gather some more data on that, wouldn't it? Just to sort of see what sorts of biases we deal with and what sorts perhaps creep in. Yeah. It sounds yeah, I'm, I'm I'm sure they're happy to review the, the issue. Yeah, so sorry, I was just also saying that as the impact factor goes higher, those biases get larger right. as well. So as you get um, the more biases are actually built in the high impact journals. Right. Um, more bias in high impact journals. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm being a little idealistic, but I would, I would expect that bias to, to shrink with time. Just, I don't know about you guys in, in, in ecology, but in statistics, you write a paper, you send it into a journal, you put it on archive, um, and every time I get a, a double blind paper to review, the first thing I do is Google the title. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, again, maybe, maybe I'm a little cynical, but I, I'd sit there going, I, I think with time, even double blinding, most of the time you're going to figure out who's written the who's written the article if you if you can. I think um yeah, I think just because you can figure it out doesn't mean people will. I mean some people would, but it's like um, we were talking about apples earlier today. There's an apple tree in a yard, and you know people just go up and pick apples. You put a fence there, people could climb the fence to get the apples if they wanted to. But just having a deterrent there makes makes it less likely. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think uh, yeah. So having having a barrier there, I think would have to help. It might. It's not a magic solution. But if there was a bias that it was reducing, I'd expect it to help. Personally. Yeah, and I think one of the things is is that there's good evidence that we do all have um, biases that we don't understand. And and so I think that you know if we're trying to create a fair process, it's good to to try and make that process as fair as possible. And if if by not knowing the names of the authors we are doing a better job individually of reviewing, I think it's important. So we should harass Bob on this one. Yeah. I think. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. So there's, there's this new thing about putting papers on archive before they're published, which I guess is coming from the Institute by Biology right now. And I think ME lets you do this, right? You can put it on the archive before submitting. So does uh, so there's a, a thing where people put papers on archive before submitting it to a journal. Can you do that with ME? Um, yeah, I'm pretty confident you can. So do you, do you guys have any experience with this so far? I'm just 
struggling on how to advise graduate students about whether to whether to put their papers on archives. So, would you advise graduate students to do it to put papers on archives? So, just a preference service. Yes. Do you do that at the moment? I've done for a few papers, and I. I never had a program, but I think it depends on the publisher and journals. I would usually write to editor in chief whether it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Short answer: yes. <laughs> <laughs> it would actually be good to know which. It'd be it'd be good to have an explicit statement on the journal's website mm -hmm. about whether they accept that or not, because I think it is a service that's really useful, and especially for PhD students who are trying to get their research out and especially in fast-moving fields, it's nice to not feel like, you know, if we've got a really slow review process, you know, somebody else is going to beat you to it. So I think it's, I think it's reasonable to allow those, but um, it'd be nice to know whether the journal does allow it. Yeah. I guess the only downside would be if you send it to ME, it gets rejected, and then you, you've eliminated some journals which don't accept mm, yes. things that have preprints. Yeah. yeah, so there's a risk of uh, uh, putting a, a preprint up on archive or something if you then want to submit it to another journal which yeah. doesn't need to do that. Can you take it down? Once it's up there, can you take it down? Or is it there forever? Can, very. Yeah, so that, that might be a way around it if you then wanted to resubmit to a journal that didn't allow it. Like, mm -hmm. I, I guess, maybe. But the idea is it's supposed to be an archive. Like, it's supposed to be there for, forever. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess, so I'm pretty confident he does let you, and I can think of one paper in particular that had five citations before it was in print. Um, so I guess there's a couple, of, a couple of advantages of doing it. One of it is it's safeguarding against getting gazumped by someone else if, if uh, your material's up there in the public domain and it takes a couple of years to, to get out in the print. There's, there's an advantage there. There's another advantage in, in just uh, getting impact earlier. Um, yeah. I was just going to comment on the preprint policy. Um, actually, a lot of ecology journals are now accepting it, accepting preprints, and the Journal of Ecology fam or British Ecological Family has been a bit slow getting a policy up. So I would encourage you to put one up. And I think currently it's there, but it's very ambiguous. Okay. Uh, from recent yeah. Okay. So British Ecological Society is ambiguous about their archive policy. Yeah. Yeah, but you can do it. <laughs> but but yeah, we'd like we'd like a, a, a clear statement about that from, from the society. Sure. Yeah. How do you feel and I came in a little late, so if this question's already been asked, sorry, but how do you feel about um, papers about our packages where where the method's already been published maybe in the statistical literature somewhere, but this is actually a whole thing about the software? Okay, how do we feel about uh, pack papers about a software package? I think we publish a lot of those, actually. So we have a section called application. Uh, it's 3,000 words um, in contrast to sort of research articles, which allow 6,000 to 7,000. So, but, I mean, as time passes, it's probably get harder and harder. But at the moment, if there's no implementation, and you implement it nicely, which I guess the encourage the use of method, we welcome such packages. Yes. I know, for instance, Ecography has got a software notes section. I think a number of the journals do now. And I mean, some of them have got quite specific guidelines about they want a particular type of um, application. I think it's a good nice idea, personally. So would you want to accept papers which are providing sort of simulations of existing methods to evaluate the methods and then possibly adapting them into the patient? So, um, so the question? The question is, does MEE accept papers that look at simulations of currently developed methods? I mean, to me, again, it comes down to the, is this paper saying something novel? So if there's already been simulations that are exploring the same questions that you are, then no. I mean, if it's exploring questions that, that we have no idea about, that are, are relevant questions and are important, and you can you can point to why they're important, then, then I'd say absolutely. Is there anything that you just want to 
don't, like rule of thumb that you won't publish. So for example, I was a guest editor for an unnamed journal, and once I got behind the scenes, scenes there was a statement that said, we will not accept anything about ecological indicators, and here's the form letter for those papers. And if that was just published on the front, I'm sure there's a lot of people who wouldn't have wasted their time. So is there some, I mean, do you have to have an animal in your paper? You know, is there, <laughs> just like, what do you look like? Yeah, so the, the, yeah, the question again, I guess. The question is, is there any, any topics or methodological as aspects we don't publish? Secret ones. Secret <laughs> ones. I, I don't really know. If <laughs> I'd be very surprised if there was. Like, I'm not. A, if it's a, if there are any secret rules about things that should be rejected, I'm not aware of them. Yeah. And you don't have to have an animal in your paper. You don't um, have to have an animal in your paper. No. I've you can have a plants, yeah. Yes. <laughs> You, you can have fungus. <laughs> yeah. But uh, much repeating, novelty is quite important. Novelty, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and also the generality is what I look for. And quite often, some methodological paper is very specific. And uh, I might reject those very specific ones. Even it's specific if in discussion they can say, this can be applied to, you know, different sorts of questions. Then I might like, ah, this is very good. One time I got sort of author to make table because I wasn't sure what can be used this their method, and they actually made table like what kind of questions they can address, and I thought, ah, that was great. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Okay, I got um, I got one question for you. Um, so, um, what have you learnt from being a, like a handling editor? Like, some are there any tricks that you've picked up that you use in writing your own papers now that you just hadn't thought of until you sort of saw people doing them? So that's cool. I'll have to use that one. Uh, it's a difficult one. If anything, good good visuals. And uh, you know, in a sort of methodological paper, it's quite dry. But the, quite often now, people do schematics, how this can be used. Those, you know, some mathematical formulas can be condensed in a conceptual schematics. I really like those. <coughs> and lots of actually ecologists, empiricists like it. And I think that's a kind of trick I, I'm starting to use quite a lot. Um, before you move on, can you describe that in a little more detail, please? <laughs> Describe in more detail. Uh, describe in a detail. Like if, like if you can, if you have a method, rather than, I mean, you, you have to have a bunch of formulas or whatever algorithm, but if you can like uh, make a schematics of how you, it can be applied and used, yeah, I can't really think of the specific situation, but like he has data, his method, this is the kind of questions you can address, what kind of output. Like as a figure or as Schematics, a uh, yeah, figure, okay. yeah, 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 conceptual schematics. <laughs> Could I just add something to that? Something that I've um, uh, encountered recently is that with publishing um, costs being so incredibly high, the margins for publishers are, are very narrow, or at least they say they are. And very often, if somebody's trying to write a book, uh, they'll have an incredibly limited budget for, um, for figures. So actually having a fantastic, really, really clear figure that can just be reproduced in a book um, is a very good way to get your stuff being the textbook <laughs> example of things. <laughs> so uh, there's a, a, a tip to share if anyone's interested. And uh, please do use color, because mm. um, color one's free like methods in ecology and evolution because it's online only journal. And the cut you know, the use of colour makes a whole a lot of difference sometimes. And colorblind friendly colour. Yeah, colorblind friendly colour. Yeah. <laughs> oh I forgot my question. Um, <laughs> things you've learned things I've being learned. <coughs> I mean probably the biggest one is is just to be really clear about, you know, this is this is what this paper's Solving this is 
this is the issue I'm dealing with, and this is how I'm doing it, and this is how to show what I'm, what I'm doing, and going through it, and just being really consistent. Uh, in, in the past, I could probably be accused of, I've got to put all these ideas that I've, that I've thought about and, and understood, and every little one of them, because I've thought of them, and they need to, they need to go out to the world, and, and so, you know, the, the big picture can often get obscured by the, the, the minutiae. Um, and so just, you know, sticking to the message and saying, you know, this is, this is the, the important idea, um, I think, I think that's, that's probably the biggest thing I've learned. Right, that's right. I'm curious, um, can, how many people here are editors? Okay, so there's quite a lot who aren't. So I, I would say being an editor is a fantastic opportunity and if you get the opportunity you should take it because um, it's just taught me a lot about the publication process. I think I think um, uh, it's really interesting to see a range of manuscripts and a range of reviewers handling them, and and it's given me much more understanding of what a review means when I receive it as an author. You know, I think I think some some reviewers are incredibly positive, and it's taught me a lot about how to write a really positive review. Um, they're polite and yet they're quite firm about the things that they believe. Um, some reviewers are very, very rude, and um, and it's and it's interesting to see how somebody who's been, you know, sometimes quite rude um, on the first round can change. You know, so it's given me a lot of insight into um, uh, different ways of approaching things, and uh, you know, so from some of them I thought I want to be more like that, and some of them I thought I need as an as an editor to learn how to handle, you know, reviewers who are ruder. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting to think about what we want as a scientific community and, and what we want to do for each other in terms of reviewing each other's papers. So I think it's a great experience. So, you know, I'd recommend if you get a chance to, you know, to um, act as an editor, I would take, I would advise anyone to take it. It's great. Uh, yeah, Guillaume? Yeah, so to put out a bit on that, do you have any tips uh, or should people to avoid, to avoid when someone starts as an editor for the first time? Uh, things to avoid. Mm. Things to avoid when you start in an editorial role yeah, for the first time. Yeah, or things to do. Or <coughs> things to do. Tips for new editors. Uh, I mean, it's probably quite obvious, but um, when I started, I just I was fairly well organised about keeping lists of people I use um, as as reviewers because it's really good to get a database of people who are great reviewers. <laughs> um, uh, and I think. Uh, I became more and more clear to the editors about the sort of papers I thought I was good at handling the ones I didn't. So I'm, I'm much better at handling papers where I know a lot about the subject. I'm not such a good generalist and I think being unashamed to sort of say, I'm, you, know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm very effective in this, I'm not so effective in that, it gives, it gives the chief editors a good, a good handle on who you are as a person, how you'll behave, you know, how you'll be most, the most benefit to them. So I think just knowing yourself and being happy to communicate that to the people up the chain and, and in all the editorial teams I've worked in, I've, I've found you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good sort of system to work in because usually people higher up are trying to support what you're doing. Um, but it's, you know, it's always good to keep that communication open. And so this list of reviewers you have, how big it is, more or less? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's not as big as I want it to be. Please come and tell me <laughs> if you want to review. <laughs> Right. So, oh, oh, my, is this the panel? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a late, a late entrant. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Would you like to take a seat? Sure. Right. What are we doing here? <laughs> this is my. Good morning. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very, very, very late. Um, <laughs> my name's Doug, and uh, I'm uh, one of the uh, one of the other editors on MEP. Mostly, I do uh, ecology. So not the evolution side. So, what do we want from Doug? Just an answer to the last question. Yes. What was the last question? Yeah. Uh, tips for new editors. Tips for new editors. Yeah. I'm still a new editor. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I think I think we're told to, to, to reject a lot of papers. That's the main, <laughs> <laughs> that's the main pressure on that side. I know. So that's it. I, I right. I'll give you the second last question then. As well. Okay. So. What was the second last question? It might have been. Um, uh, okay, we'll just go to the next question. We'll go to the next um, question. How do you strike the balance when you first get a paper 
yeah, you should give it a read and so you can reject it as soon as possible if, that, if you don't think it's going to go anywhere. Uh, and, but then you need to read, read it well enough to, you know, to understand it and then and, and, and submit it on. So you can either, you know, spend a lot of time really trying to figure it out, or you can read it really quickly and just kind of look at it superficially for construct, construction and then send it on. I mean, do you, 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 do you struggle with that, or you know, how do you, do you have a certain amount of time, or how do you, how do you handle that? That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, I, I try to I try to redo it essentially, uh, so it's a, it's it's effort. Like right? a full review. Well, you don't write it down necessarily, right. but I mean, I, when I re, when I reply to the authors, if it's a rejection, for example, uh, I try to do a sort of half review, and and the, I'm looking for three things, right? I'm looking for it has to be a decent paper. To be that's just one, right? And it, there's one really easy thing to do is to see if they're comparing with the best practice. And so you can see a really good method, and there's no comparison with the best other things that are being done. I don't bother to send it for review, right? And then the third is that it has to be ready to go, right? So a bit of code that's not, you can't run, it's not worth publishing either. Um, it's got to it's gotta be something that, that someone can use. That, I mean, that's the purpose of the journal. Uh, last question. Uh, Jose? Um, so there are at least a few thousand, probably, researchers in the world that are not non-English native speakers. They don't have; they are not lucky enough to have friends or co-authors that are. And obviously, at the end, the, the quality of the English of those papers is going to be probably a bit lower or compromised. Um, how do you react as as a speaker editor if you get a paper that a has quite a few mistakes or problems with English? B, that you can't understand because of the quality of the English. Excellent. Would you react to that? Excellent question. How do you react to something which is written by a non-native English speaker that has English mistakes? Yeah. It's a difficult question. Um, we'll pass it on this. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, Jane, yeah. You go on that. So, so I think um, I look at the team of authors and if there's People I believe are first language English authors. If the paper's really bad, I would I would actually write back and ask them, you know, if if, if they've clearly got someone in the team that should have been able to to provide that function and hasn't, I think that's a failure of the team. Um, but you know, I don't think we should be expecting perfect English. You know, I think it needs to be understandable. And and if it's something isn't as elegant as something else, it doesn't matter as long as the scientific content is clear and. Um, uh, you know, is clear and, and, and won't be misinterpreted. And, and I think the other thing is that um, I want this to be a fair publishing process, so I put more effort into ones that are, where English isn't the first language, and I try and suggest some editorial things. Is it time for the journals to have a free service that can support? For you? Yeah. Someone's got to pay. Yeah, but the, I mean, it's sharing the burden. Yes, yeah, volunteering. Yeah. Yeah. Part of the money that goes into publishing. So, Matt, yeah. Matt, did you want to have a go at the first question? At the, at the first question? Yeah. Second shot at it, or? Well, I can have a, have a shot at it. Uh, I mean, if I get a paper, I mean, I ha I've had one recently actually where it was clear that the authors were, were non native speakers. Uh, if it's. If I can't understand anything, I feel like I've got no option but to reject it. Uh, and, and similar to what Jane said, if, so, so long as, you know, the paper, the paper I'm thinking about, that obviously put a huge amount of effort into, into making it understandable. And was it, you know, fluent English like, you know, a, a top native speaker? No. But you could tell that they put a huge amount of effort into to making it so that the, the readers could at least understand what they were saying, and and and, and I I had to respect that, and you know the paper got accepted. Um, so so similar to what Jane said, you know I try and give it a, a, a fair shot. You know if there's if there's some some English that isn't quite right, well hey look we can deal with that. But I, I think there's also the reciprocal that that I can tell how much effort someone's put in. And, 
you know, if, if I can tell, hey, look, these guys aren't native English speakers, but they put a lot of effort, and you know, I'll I'll, I'll try and respect that as, as as much as I can, and, and try and give you as, as much of a fair shot as I can. You know, life's not fair, unfortunately. So you know, but but up up to the point I can, I'll try and try and respect that. Yeah, I think I think we're all in agreement that really it's a, it's about the science, and so um, if the science is good, like then that's that's what we're looking for, and where it becomes a problem is where where you can't understand the science. Um, but if everyone I think is trying to make allowances for non-native English. Uh, I was Nigel, just going to say that Wiley Blackwell actually have an editorial service. Wiley it's Blackwell a, have an editorial fee, service. It's a fee for payment. Um, you you pay for it, but they if you do. If you are a non-English speaker, you can send it to the editorial service for that particular so can, can, and, uh, and most, I think most publishers are going down that route as well, because they can make good money out of it. But also there is there is um you know that, that service is available for most publishers. Too. Okay, so, so most publishers seem to have a service where you can pay to get help with the English. But that doesn't actually seem fair, does it? Because yeah. it means that the burden of payment is always on people who yes. um, Well, I think uh, last one. No, no, we had the last one. This is the last one. <laughs> now, now, let's yeah, let's wrap it up. So, thank you very much to the panel. <laughs>